Hi, and thank you for choosing Prophecy. In this video, we are doing a high-level technical overview on the event-based sensor. We will introduce the main event-based concepts and definitions used within our sensor datasheets and over our other training videos. We will also familiarize you with the event-based glossary. This video targets all kinds of engineers. As a prerequisite, we do suggest you watch the What is Event-Based Vision video on our YouTube channel to get a high-level introduction. In this video, we are going to learn about the event-based sensor, the pixel architecture and how the pixel works, the readout, the data output by the sensor, and the main sensor characteristics used within the sensor datasheets. We will start with the event-based sensor and its functionality. Prophecy event sensors are inspired by the function of the human eye. In the human eye, light passes through the cornea and the pupil and is focused by the lens onto the retina that is the light-sensitive region at the back of the eye. In the retina, special cells called photoreceptors transform the light into electrical signals. These signals are carried by the optic nerve to the brain that interprets the signals and forms a perception of the environment. Prophecy have designed pixels that operate independently and asynchronously, reacting only to changes in the scene similar to photoreceptors in the human retina. The prophecy sensors don't acquire image-by-image -image data at a fixed rate as frame-based cameras do. On the contrary, event-based sensors are scene-driven. They generate sparse data called events as a reaction to the captured changes within the scene. Here are some examples of data captured by the event-based cameras. The rotating dot, falling particles, pedestrians, particle spattering, vibrating motors, driver awareness. In the data visualization, we use three colors. Events generated by the event sensor are shown by a light blue and a dark blue color. Light blue corresponds to an increased light intensity, and dark blue corresponds to a decreased light intensity. The absence of data is shown by a white color. We will focus on the data with the rotating dot. These data have been captured by an event-based camera watching a rotating disk with a black dot. The data are shown in three dimensions, including the X and Y sensor space and the time dimension. Here, the time axis is showing one second snippet of time. We'll see the comparison between the data acquired by the event camera on the right and the simulated data from the frame camera on the left. As you can see, the data from the event camera are continuous over time. The pixels detect the rotating dot and its position at each single moment. The circular rotation of the dot looks like a spiral in this XYT space. There are no gaps in the event data and it's easy to track the dot over the space and time. Each pixel generates an event at detecting a change in the scene without waiting for other pixels and without generating a full frame. The frame-based data are simulated as snapshots at a fixed frame rate. With this approach, it's not as easy to track the dot as its position changes between the frames drastically, and higher speeds increase this distance, resulting in a higher displacement between frames. Let's see how data are generated by the event sensor. At the time t1, the rotating dot is detected by one pixel of the sensor array, and we'll call that a change detection. This change detection is transmitted to the readout, timestamped, and output by the sensor as an event at the time t1. This event is an on event that corresponds to the detection of a positive contrast change, or an increase in light intensity. It is shown in the XYT space by a light blue color. The rotating dot is then detected by another pixel of the sensor array, and this change detection is transmitted to the readout, timestamped, and output by the sensor as an event at time t2. This event is an off event that corresponds to the detection of a negative contrast change, or a decrease in light intensity, and it is shown by a dark blue color. The rotating dot is detected by another pixel, and this change detection is transmitted to the readout, timestamp, and output by the sensor as an event at time t3. This event is an on event, and it is shown by a light blue color. The succession of the generated events will form a spiral in the XYT space. Now we will learn about the pixel architecture and how the event-based pixel works. So here we'll take a look at a single pixel of the sensor. In this picture here, we can see the photodiode and the logic. Note that this picture corresponds to an approximation of our Gen 3 sensor. Gen 4 and the IMX sensors are 3D stacked and thus the photodiode is on a separate layer. Each pixel operates as a contrast change detector similar to a logarithmic photoreceptor in the human eye. 
The incoming light hits the photodiode and generates a photocurrent, which is converted to a voltage by a logarithmic converter. The voltage is compared to the contrast sensitivity thresholds, and the change detection is notified on crossing the contrast sensitivity threshold. Precisely, there are two contrast sensitivity thresholds, one for an increase in light intensity, the on threshold, and one for a decrease in light intensity, the off threshold. When the change detector voltage crosses the on contrast sensitivity threshold, a CD on event with a positive polarity is generated, and the voltage is reset to the reference value, as you can see here and here. If the change detector voltage changes without crossing any threshold, then no event is generated. When the change detector voltage crosses the off contrast sensitivity threshold, a CD off event with a negative polarity is generated, and the voltage is then reset to the reference value. This animation allows us to understand when events are generated or not generated and the role of the contrast sensitivity threshold. These contrast sensitivity thresholds can be adjusted by the user via the sensitivity biases to make the sensor more or less sensitive. We call this procedure the bias tune, and it is aimed at tuning the sensor settings to acquire optimal data for the setup environment and the application requirements. Now we can see how the readout works. On the prophecy event sensor, the readout is on demand. It is not a scan asking for pixel values, rather the opposite, the readout is waiting for pixel requests to be read out. Pixels are requesting the arbiter system spontaneously and independently. Here's an example of the pixels requesting to be read out. At first, the readout chooses the pixel row to serve by enforcing the rule of first come, first serve. Once a pixel row is chosen, its Y address and a vector of active pixels within the row is read out and the arbiter returns an acknowledge signal to the pixels. All of the events which are read out together from that same row will have the same timestamp. When the readout of the current row is finished, the arbiter chooses the next row to serve using the same rule of first come, first serve. Again, the Y address and a vector of active pixels in that row is read out and timestamped. This animation allows us to understand how the readout works and how to optimize the setup for better readout performance. For example, as the readout can process several events in a row in parallel, the orientation of the sensor and the object should prioritize distribution of data over few full rows rather than spread between different rows. Let's take a look at what data is output by the event sensor. The prophecy sensor outputs events, and we also call them CD events, that are the contrast changes detected by the pixel of the sensor, transferred via the readout, and timestamp. And each event packet contains the following information the timestamp, the pixel's address in the sensor array, and the contrast detection polarity. A polarity of 1 corresponds to the detection of a positive contrast or increase in light for an on event. A polarity of 0 corresponds to the detection of a negative contrast or decrease in light for an off event. Events can be visualized as a 3D point in the XYT space. The data are very sparse but continuous over time. The data sampling rate is scene-driven and depends on the activity within the scene. Data is generated only on crossing the contrast sensitivity thresholds. In contrast, frame cameras generate full frames at a fixed sampling rate. Frames are generated over a regular time interval even if nothing happens within the scene. The size of the frame is also fixed and constant, therefore the amount of data is predictable and is not affected by the activity within the scene. In the case of fast motion, there is a risk to miss data. In the case of a slow motion or a static scene, there is the possibility to acquire too much useless data. Here's a simplified example of data output by the event sensor and frame sensors watching the same scene, both the cameras watching the rotating disk with a dot. In the case of the frame camera on top, the frames are regularly sampled, and each time a full frame is acquired, there are gaps in between each of the frames, hence missing data. In the case of the event sensor on the bottom, the data is continuous, however no full image is ever generated. The following sensor characteristics are used to define the KPIs. Contrast sensitivity, background rate, pixel response time, pixel latency, and jitter. In this video, we won't give the full KPIs nor the exact values of the sensor characteristics because the values will vary from sensor generation to generation. We encourage you to check the sensor datasheet for your particular sensor. And we will introduce each sensor characteristic and give you the definition so you know what to look for. Contrast sensitivity. 
The principal task of event sensors is detection of contrast changes. We'll talk about temporal contrast as a contrast change over the time for a single pixel. We'll use the Weber definition of contrast, therefore the temporal contrast is computed as a ratio of the difference between the high and low illuminance to the low illuminance multiplied by 100%. Here we use a linear contrast definition, however the logarithmic contrast can be also used. For example, it is used in the IMX636 sensor datasheet. We'll illustrate the contrast sensitivity of the sensor using an S-curve showing the response probability of the pixels over a range of temporal contrasts for a given illumination. Response probability represents the percentage of pixels that generate events exposed to a given temporal contrast step. The S-curve here shown is an abstraction, as the contrast sensitivity depends on the light level, and the S-curve will be shifted to the right or the left depending on that light level. Contrast sensitivity will vary between sensor generations, so for exact characterization values, we do advise you to check the datasheet for your sensor. The contrast sensitivity S-curve shows how good the sensor is in detecting the contrast. The optimal contrast sensitivity depends on the application requirements and the environment. Some applications require detecting very small contrast changes, however, for other applications, detecting a large change is sufficient. The contrast sensitivity of the sensor can be improved by tuning the sensor biases like bias diff on and bias diff off. We will demonstrate this in a dedicated future video on bias tuning. Higher sensor sensitivity will lead to generating more events that will consume more bandwidth. Therefore, there will be a trade-off between the sensor sensitivity and the reasonable amount of data. If the environment can be controlled, then the contrast between the object and the background can be improved by optimizing the setup and the lighting, for example, changing your type of lighting, the positioning, or its direction. Background rate. In the absence of activity in the scene, ideally the sensor doesn't generate events. However, some events are still generated due to noise within the pixel, and we can characterize this noise by measuring the background rate. The background rate is defined as an average number of events generated per pixel under constant and static illumination. It is expressed as hertz per pixel. The background rate is a consequence of photonic and electronic noise within the pixel. It varies with light level. With default sensor settings, the background rate is about 1 hertz for currently available sensor generation. The background rate can be reduced by tuning the sensor biases like the bias HPF and the sensitivity biases. We will demonstrate this in a dedicated future video on bias tuning. Pixel response time. The time delay from the contrast change to the change detection by a single pixel is called the pixel response time. Pixel response time is not fixed and it can vary. Here's an example. There is a contrast change that happened at time T0. Pixel 1 reacted at time T1, pixel 2 at T2, and pixel 3 reacted at T3. The response times of the three pixels are different. Therefore, we compute the probability density function, PDF, to characterize the response time among the pixels and the trials. We'll do this by measuring the pixel's response time on stimulus and repeating the measurement multiple times. Then we'll compute the probability distribution of the pixel's response times. The PDF shows how much more likely the pixel will respond within a certain amount of time. From the plot, we can see that most of the pixels will respond within 250 microseconds. However, some pixels will respond much faster and much slower. This is the basis for measuring our pixel latency and jitter. The pixel response time depends on the sensor, its settings, the biases, the light level, and the contrast. Pixel latency and jitter. Pixel latency is computed as a mode of the pixel's response time's delays to the temporal contrast step. It is expressed in microseconds. Pixel latency shows the delay between the change in the scene and its detection by the pixel. A smaller pixel latency is better. Pixel jitter is computed as a difference between the first and third quartile of response time. Jitter corresponds to the temporal precision at a pixel level. Pixel latency and jitter vary among the sensor generations and they are given within the sensor datasheet for the specific sensor. Pixel latency and jitter decrease when light intensity increases. And pixel latency and jitter can be improved upon by tuning the sensor biases like bias FO, which will be demonstrated in a dedicated future video on bias tuning. Total latency. The total latency should not be confused with the pixel latency. The total latency is the delay between the change in the scene and the event processing within software. It's a sum of the pixel latency, the readout latency, 
the data transfer latency, and the software processing latency. The last three, readout transfer and software latencies, are influenced by the event rate. Higher event rates increase these latencies. Therefore, it's important to keep the event rate reasonable. For this, we suggest you optimize the setup with changing the ROI, tuning your bias settings, and using the digital filters. Please note that the digital filters are after the readout, and therefore they will not affect the readout latency. Another note is that there is timestamping on the sensor chip. Thus, the accuracy of the event detection is not impacted by the data transfer and the software latencies. Event-based pixel architectures and the event sensor implementation brings with it a number of advantages, such as the continuous data from asynchronous pixels, sparse data where the amount of data varies within the scene dynamics, adaptive scene-driven sampling at a rate of one microsecond timestamp resolution, low latencies, higher dynamic ranges, and efficient data for machine vision. To conclude, we've given a brief overview of the event-based sensor and the concepts including the sensor functionality, the pixel architecture, the readout functionality, the data output and the data types from the sensor, the sensor characteristics used in the KPI and data sheets. These concepts are the introduction for our other training. More details can be found in our documentation, knowledge center, and publications. Thank you for watching, and we will see you in the next video.